Welcome, everyone. This is the official Zoom party release for volume two of Interfaith, the musical. I'm so happy that all of you have come tonight to help celebrate with me. This is a milestone in the journey of the musical to the stage. But a lot of people say, how did this great passion for interfaith engagement begin? And the first video I, I want to show you is called My Love Affair with Interfaith. So I had this wild idea in 1991 to create an interfaith seder. And I ended up inviting 85 people. It was Passover, and although it's the Jewish holiday, many people have found that Passover is very magnetic. It brings people together because it's a celebration of liberation, of liberation from oppression. And so everybody can identify with that. It doesn't matter how you call God or if you even believe in God. That is a human expression that we can all cherish. And after that happened, I was led to meet an extraordinary African-American minister, Dolores Gray, and she and I found that we had a lot in common. And after a series of conversations, something happened, something, I guess, revelatory happened. And we decided that we would create what may have been the first interfaith peace pilgrimage to the Holy Land. We wanted to bring in particular the, the black and the Jewish community together because we had been such good friends during the civil rights movement. But also since then there had been a chasm developing. We wanted to repair that but we invited many people. And the idea was that we would travel from Cairo through the Sinai Desert to Jerusalem. We would share our faith stories and traveling together and dialoguing, we would have a chance to develop trust and understanding and fulfill our curiosity about one another. And in Jerusalem, we had as a culminating event, we had the Universal Freedom Seder in which all of the pilgrims participated, but also we invited people from all over the world to join us. About 50 people, Israelis, Arabs, Indians, Sri Lankans, Ethiopians, Jews and Muslims, Christians and Hindus, participated in a universal Seder called a Festival of Freedom at Beit Shmuel in Jerusalem. The Seder was led by Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shlomi, leader of the Jewish spiritual renewal movement in the United States. This is a Seder of the future, not a Seder of the past. We are using the template of the past in order to dream of the miracle of the future that's possible. People of all faiths, races, and ethnic backgrounds sat together. The traditional Haggadah was revised. The Seder plate included an olive branch for hope, and the prayers included readings from the Quran and the Lord's Prayer. A prayer shawl decorated with the personal messages of peace by the participants provided background. The event was organized by a Jewish filmmaker and an African-American minister. I got three prophecies from people that I did not know that said that I would be leading the most unique and unusual tours to Israel. It would include African-American Jews, Muslims, and Catholics, and that's precisely what we're doing here tonight at Beth Shmuel. The notion of it came from the traditional Passover Seder, but this is something totally new and different. Memorial candles were lit in memory of the people of many nations who were killed, and the hope was expressed that peoples in all the troubled spots of the world and Jews and Arabs could begin a new chapter of peaceful coexistence. The story of the Jewish people's freedom is described in many occasions in the Holy Quran. And if there is anything we desperately need, it's for us, the, the children of Abraham, the cousins, to come back together. The children of Abraham are about to become reconciled. And we did it in 93, 94, 95. And then again, I organized one in the year 2000. And whenever we were together, Dolores and I, Christian and Jew, black and white, people would look at us and they would say, well, this is really amazing, but who, who sponsored this? And she and I would look at each other and we turn back and we'd say, God. And then people would say, no, really? And then we look at each other and we turn back and we say, no, really, because it was God inspired. And I think anybody who works in the interfaith community will, will have to agree with me that whatever work we do is God inspired. So now you know how it all started with 85 people at a Seder for Passover and my realizing 
that there must be ways to bring people together out of the ordinary ways. As I grew and developed as an interfaith activist and leader, and I suddenly had this musical project before me, I was able to introduce it in a big way to the Parliament of the World's Religions in Toronto, Canada in 2018. Warm greetings to all of you. The evolution of Interfaith the Musical is a mystical, magical story that very clearly shows the hand of the divine. About four years ago, I was taking a walk when suddenly words and music tumbled out. I have no idea from where or why, because I'm a filmmaker and a writer, not a composer and a musician, but the words were very clear. And it was, what if, when you awoke, you were wearing a stranger's shoes? What if, when you awoke, you shared your enemy's extremist views? What if, when you awoke, you think in color, not black and white? What if, when you awoke, you could imagine that being right? And then the chorus, which is actually the reason why all this music was written, is what if, what if, what if we all could see the beauty of one expanding humanity? And then 30 more songs came out. <laughs> what if my children go astray, spiritual but not religious? Why can't science and religion be friends? I'm a Buju. I Buddha said I'm Jewish, I'm a Buju. <laughs> and I was saying, why me? But I knew why. I figured it out because after 30 songs, after 30 years of working as an interfaith activist and leader and, and understanding that this was the most important work being done in the world today, we need to go mainstream. And where is mainstream? In the musical theaters of our country because that's where unsuspecting people will go to hear a great story. <laughs> and so I was determined and that's why I was selected because I have come to love and appreciate all the faiths working together with people of every community, including atheists and free thinkers of every community. And I know that this show needs to be on Broadway to say, yes, we want to see who we are on the stage, who we are, who we are. So I'll just tell you why this song is being sung tonight. It's because of someone from Canada. He heard the song, What If When You Awoke. Neil McMillan, if you're here, you can raise your hand. And he said, Ruth, I love your song, but what about the Baha'is? I hadn't mentioned the Baha'is, I mentioned the Buddhists and the Christians and the Jews and Jehovah's Witnesses and the Muslims, and I hadn't mentioned the Baha'is, and I went home and I agonized and I thought, 4,270 religions, how am I going to get them all in? <laughs> I wanted to be as inclusive as possible. So this song actually is a result of a Canadian interfaith activist, and it's called, Let's Make Room at the Table. What about the Rastafarians, Omicomars, and Baha'i? Did I mention Unitarians? We're all part of the interfaith. Why? What about global new thought? The Shinto and the Druze. The day after, I had people coming up to me all day long, and the first thing they said to me is, let's make room at the table, because they remember the melody. And that was a perfect sign for me that people not only enjoyed the music, but that it was memorable, that people would remember that line. And what an important line. 
there is a unique relationship between a composer and arranger because it's up to the arranger to get into the head of the composer to try to figure out exactly what the composer wanted when the song was written. My name is Casey Dogertis and I'm the arranger. And we had a very unusual way of working together, maybe not so unusual, but for us, I had never done anything like that before. What would happen is that on one of my famous walks, <laughs> I would come back with a song, I would write down the lyrics immediately, I'd remember the melody, I'd call Casey, and I'd say, I'm about to sing you a song. And he said, okay, and he would hang up. That was the code for him not to talk to me and not to, to wait until I would sing the song to him. I'd call back, I'd record the song on his answering machine, and then I would send him the lyrics. And he would take several days to think about it, to listen to it many times, and then he would start playing with it until he came to something which he thought approximated the feeling, the tone, and the goal of the song. Because all the lyrics of the songs have very special meanings. And he would then send me his first draft, his first musical arrangement, and I would listen to it. And if it was exactly what I wanted, that was it. But most of the time we had to work back and forth until we got exactly to not only what I wanted, but always to something better because of the enormous talent and genius of Casey de Gerdas. And here is Casey himself telling you about volume two. So the second album is, it's just like a sequel. It's bigger, badder, more explosions, uh, more excitement, more of everything. No, I'm just kidding. But it, it is sort of because just because we've evolved in the creative process since we began. So I feel like I feel the musical better. I have created some very, I think, interesting things that I wouldn't have thought of when I was starting to work on this process. Ruth connected us with some great singers. I'm singing more songs myself. I'm taking on a whole bunch of different characters that have stretched my personality and my voice to new places. It's a very compelling collection of songs. Ruth wrote some, some very interesting and, and heart-wrenching and funny and dramatic and I mean all of the emotional notes that you could ask for in a musical they're all represented. We have been waiting, anticipating, will the one special one come today? The first song that I'd like to share with you this evening is called We Are The Ones. That's actually an abbreviation for we are the ones we've been waiting for. Not just you and me, but everyone. Not just he and she, but everyone. Not just they and them, but everyone together. The first seeds that germinated from this idea came from about 30 years ago when I went to attend a meeting in someone's home and the keynote speaker that night was Barbara Marks Hubbard, who was considered the mother of the interspiritual movement. And there were so many of us that we were not only filled the living room, but we filled the hallway and we were sitting on the stairs. And she looked at us and she said, you know, everybody here is waiting for someone, some special person, some divine essence, some savior to come and save us from our particular state that we're in right now. And some people are waiting for the Messiah so that there might be peace throughout the land. But I have news for you, she said. No one is coming. And what if the one special one never comes? And there was a gasp in the room. I think she might have maybe even offended some of the people who were there. She said, the truth is no one is coming because we are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the ones that are going to save the situation. We
gone around the bin and you've reached the end. You're in need of a friend. Then you come to the right place. Uh -huh. Come to the right place. Oh, Jesus is here for you. I experimented writing all different kinds of songs. But one of the things that I had never tried before was writing a gospel song. And it was another one of the songs that just kind of tumbled out. And I was surprised by it because the title was Jesus is here for you. And I'm a Jewish woman. And that is not my frame of reference in my, my life of faith and my religious life. But, and I was, I was puzzled by it. But then I thought, well, after all, Irving Berlin, who a Jewish composer, he wrote the most beloved Christmas song of all times, White Christmas. So what is it? How is it possible to cross that border and to be able to compose a song, not from your tradition, and yet have people listening to it feel that it is from your tradition? And maybe that tradition is the tradition of love and compassion not any particular religion. heart attack, major heart attack, 2010, I almost passed. Um, I've had three kids. They would have made it, but I wouldn't have if it wasn't for the good Lord. When they put me to sleep, I saw the light. And they thought I was gone then with my daughter still in me. And when I came to, it was a miracle because it was a black doctor who came in General Hospital. I had been there for two days in the lobby with my appendix about to erupt. And this black doctor walked in and he was an Indian doctor with a big white natural white coat and he just touched me and he says, how long has this lady been laying here? And they said, for two days. And he said, get her ready for surgery right now. So when they got me ready, I saw the light and I heard the voice and he let me know, it's not time for you to come home yet. You still got work to do. Oh. They had lost me. He's like, we're so glad to have you back, Miss Bell. I was like, I'm glad to be back. Okay, where's the doctor? The you know the doctor with the big natural, and he's an Indian. And the doctor looked at me. He says, I'm your doctor, and he was a Caucasian with glasses. I was like, No, you're not. You're not my doctor. Where is the doctor with the big natural? And it was like I asked a nurse. I asked everybody that was around in General Hospital, and that was my angel again to save me and bring me. Jesus is here for you, oh yeah. This song means a lot to me because every time I went through anything in life, I always say, God, if you get me out of this, I'll do better. If you're not quite sure, but your motives are pure, and your soul needs a cure, then you come to the right place. Then you come to the right place. Do you understand, though, that the person who wrote that song, right, yeah. is not Christian? Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, my God. You're not for real. They did good. Even if they're not Christian, they wrote it from the heart. For our iniquities he died, but rest assured he's still alive. When you open up your heart, Jesus will play his part. Oh yes, 
share with you the story, the theme of the play. Our protagonist, Maya Gold, is an ardent interfaith activist, a Jewish leader who has committed her life to bringing people of all faiths together. She's been working fearlessly to create events to bring people together so that they can come to know one another and become friends. And yet suddenly, her own daughter, announces that she's going to marry outside of the fold. And Maya is truly, truly devastated. And she confronts her daughter. And her daughter's response to her is this song, Love is Love. Love is love. Love is love. Love knows no borders. Love won't take. loved the opportunity to sing this song in particular because when you take the name of of the musical of interfaith i think something that you and i really bonded over when we were discussing when we were talking about the song and what it means and we were when we were in the recording studio was love is the way to get over differences that when you start with love that's the way to realize we're actually not that different. And if anything, we're much similar, much more similar than we think we are. You are the daughter of a rabbi. What would your parents do if you came home and announced that you were marrying a non-Jew? How would they receive the news? They don't care so much who I end up with in terms of whether, you know, whether or not he's Jewish, but more so, does he share the same values that I do? And does he understand the importance of raising Jewish children because it's a part of my tradition, my heritage, and my culture? And that is important for any child. So very often in a situation of pending intermarriage, people will consult their clergy, their rabbi, their priest, their reverend, their pastor, seeking help in how to navigate the world of interfaith marriage. and. As you will hear from this song, one of the most popular songs of volume two, Ask the Rebbe, does the Rebbe have an answer? Ask the Rebbe, ask the Rebbe, ask the Rebbe, he will know. But the Rebbe isn't certain, first I come and then I grow. Ask the Rebbe, ask the Rebbe, ask the Rebbe, he will know. But this Rebbe needs a Rebbe to guide him how to go. I would like to share with the audience that you were actually in the very first production of Jesus Christ Superstar on Broadway. On Broadway, right. yeah, that's right. When I was a young hippie, now I'm an old hippie. <laughs> <laughs> and would you, because you know about the story and you know about the the design behind the story of why I'm so eager to bring this to the stage. So I know you appreciate it in a special way as someone who has done a lot of interfaith engagement and yourself. Yes. So perhaps you could talk about that for a moment. Well, I mean, the, the, um, uh, the way to uh, bring uh, about uh, understanding is through the arts, uh, especially if people, if people sing together of different faiths, uh, there's, it's very hard to dislike each other. You know, in, in Hebrew, the word for uh, for for uh, for choir is makela, which means a community, right? And 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 you extend that community by bringing music to people. The listeners are just as important as the performers because you're not going to have you're not going to have a reason to perform unless there's an audience. And so, when you bring people together in that way, you uh, you prepare the the path for peace. I want to thank you for what you bring to the production and also who you are, not just you. how you sing. 
very nice. I appreciate you very much. Thank you. Cause there are endless permutations and myriad explanations with likely implications for each interpretation. And unknown complications to perplexing situations and many variations for every disputation. theater production must have a love song. And so this is a love song between Tamar, the daughter of Maya, and Stargazer, an indigenous man who are madly in love and who know that their parents on both sides do not approve of the union. It is sung by Aaron Rye and Martinez Matutis. Heart to heart. You're my stargazer. You're my tomorrow. You never waver. You're my north star. You are my partner. And you're my mate. You are the best catch. You're the perfect bait. is sung by two people from the story. One is Maya, the mother of Tamar, who doesn't want her daughter to marry the Native American man, and Kaletaka, who is the father of Stargazer, who is equally adamant that his son not marry out of the tribe. How can I bless him when he endangers our tradition? Susan Mackey Miller here by any chance? Yes, I'm here, Ruth. Oh, I love how you keep your your span, your reach for to include so many people, and I think that's so beautiful. Just to the, the whole idea of interfaith, and I, my husband and I, we both are 
of the belief system that we're so connected. All of us are so connected. What was going through your mind, the line which says we are valued and have worth? Well, I, I, I'm a mother to three sons and they light up when they know they have value. And, and I do the same thing. My boys put the most beautiful posts like, you know, for my birthday or Mother's Day or whatever it is. And, and I light up for that. They're giving me blessings in return. Blessings, we all crave blessings. We need to feel that we are cherished and have one. I would say that most of the unhappy people in the world probably haven't been blessed enough. Blessings, precious blessings from the day we born till our last day. Amen. I fervently believe that we all need to hear blessings from the people we love. We all need to be told we are cherished and we have worth. And I think many people who are unhappy in the world today, it's not for lack of money, for lack of success in their profession, or even lack of success as a parent themselves, but that they did not receive blessings from their parents. I just want to mention something that I think is very relevant right now. When Ruth came to New York, she visited my home and we both went out on the terrace and she put her two hands on my head and she recited the priestly benediction in our tradition. It's the three, it's the most sacred blessing that you could give to another human being. And I remember that moment was absolutely beautiful and sacred and filled with light. I really want to honor the light that you have and that you've brought all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Phil Schroeder is in the audience here. Phil, are you here? I'm here. Hi. Phil and I have been working on the libretto. We finished act one. We're working on act two. I want to give you a moment, Phil, to say a few things about what it's been like working on this project. A lot of the work that we've done uh, has been to unearth you know, everything that Ruth is talking about tonight. Um, uh, you know, the, the uh, matters of the soul, matters of, of religion and, and faith and interfaith, and, and also what drives characters, what drives people to uh, the, the rational and sometimes irrational uh, ways they feel and things they do, which is what drama is. Phil constantly has been reminding me that the stage is about conflict. Every scene has to have some conflict in it. And every scene has to move the action toward the next scene. We've had a, a really wonderful time, um, I think, exploring drama together uh, from our two different backgrounds. And, um, and I think coming, to a, coming into a story that, that, that at times feels like it just writes itself. The process of collaboration is, is tender and beautiful and fascinating and challenging because we are at times when we come to certain dialogue and Phil says, no, I think they would say it this way. And I say, well, I don't feel that. And we go back and forth until we, we always find something that works. But that, that, that little friction is very helpful in the creative process. I, I think the thing that really bubbles to the top when working with Ruth as, uh, as, any of you who know her will will understand is there's a great great deal of authenticity uh, in uh, in her work and what she wants and what uh, what will what will work for her in the end I think is is if the characters feel like the characters that she has in her mind if they reflect the the real values. I salute you. Phil. It's a pleasure. And now I'd like to play the very last song for you. This is who we are. This is who we are and who we're meant to be. Just take a look at us. What a grand humanity. We have made mistakes, imperfect as we are. Love. We stumble and we fall.
Thank you, everyone.